Hello, everyone. I think that now you should be able to see us and now hear me. Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go. So, hello, <laughs> I am very sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties, but we managed to make it work. So my name is Raquel and today I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen Murphy in our Brain-Body Interaction Seminar Series. Uh, just a reminder, these seminars happen every Monday and we are bringing together scientists which are interested in the interface between the nervous system, organ physiology, immunology, reproduction, aging, cancer. So stay tuned for updates in our website and worldwide neuro seminars. So before introducing our wonderful speaker, I'm also going to remind you that you can ask any questions during the talk here using the ask a question button. And also if you want to meet the speaker after the talk, uh, we will have a Zoom Q&A session and I will write the link here in the chat in a little bit. So now for real, I'm eager to introduce Dr. Colleen Murphy. Uh, I'm going to very briefly summarize her impressive career. So we have time for her talk. I really think she's a role model. So Dr. Colleen Murphy is a professor at the Department of Molecular Biology and LSI Genomics at Princeton University the director of the Simons Collaboration on Plasticity and the Aging Brain and of the Glenn Center for Quantitative Aging Research at Princeton. And she is also the associate director of the Lewis Single Institute for Integrative Genomics. She received her bachelor's degree in biochemical and biophysical sciences at the University of Houston and her PhD at the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University. After her postdoc at the UCSF, she moved to Princeton University, where she started her lab. In her very young career, she has already published around 100 papers and received more than 40 awards, including several NIH Director Pioneer Awards and HHMI Faculty Scholar. I think it's also heroic the amount of teaching, outreach, and service that she has been involved in, together with being an invited speaker in almost 200 events. And not only that, she is also a mother of two kids. <laughs> Her research group studies aging and the quantification of quality of life with age, including the decline of cognitive and reproductive capacities with age. They develop behavioral, genomic, genetic, biochemical, robotic, and computational approaches using C elegance as their model system. Today, she will be talking about transgenerational inheritance of pathogen avoidance. Uh, so thank you so much, Colin, for being here with us today. The stage is all yours. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, okay. and I'm going to move okay, great. <laughs> All right, thank you, Raquel, especially for the very nice introduction. And um, I really wish I could be there. It'd be really fun to see you all in uh, Portugal. All right, and I apologize for the technical difficulties, so I hope that everything will go well the rest of the talk. So today I'm gonna tell you about the work that my lab has been doing very recently um, on trying to understand how transgenerational inheritance of a pathogen avoidance can help an organism survive better. So as you all know, organisms constantly make decisions. We decide what to eat, um, who we have kids with. We also have to decide how to avoid pathogens and we learn and remember information. Now the organism I'm gonna tell you about today, C. elegans, it also makes really important decisions for its survival. Um, it also decides what to eat and um, it remembers what it eats. Uh, it, mates, but also this has effects not only on its progeny, but on the lifespan of the organism itself. They have um, a reproductive span that is actually shorter than its lifespan. And um, what I'll tell you about today is the work that we've done 
to understand how animals uh, in the species, they really like a lot of different foods, but it, they have to learn how to avoid pathogens. And this is how we stumbled on this finding of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of learned pathogen avoidance. So those of you who have heard about TEI, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, you'll remember that this is a phenomenon that's actually pretty um, interesting and not really well understood. This is a phenomenon where um, uh, individuals have undergone some sort of really severe trauma, often a famine. And while those individuals uh, suffer from that, they can also pass on uh, effects to their progeny and grand progeny. So this has been particularly noted in the event of famines where there have been adverse health effects, especially metabolic disorders in their progeny and grand progeny. So we were wondering whether parental environment exposure affects progeny as well. And this was a project that was started by my graduate student, Rebecca Moore. And she worked very closely with the senior scientist in my lab, Rachel Koletsky, to do all the work I'll tell you about. So Rebecca was really interested in this question. In particular, can behaviors be inherited? Now, everything I'm gonna tell you about today regards C. elegans. And so we're trying to understand how these ideas um, play into a simple organism. So C. elegans lives not just in the lab where we feed it E. coli, but out in the normal, you know, it's a normal environment. It lives on rotting fruit. And the reason that it lives there is because that's where it can find <clears throat> its food source, which are bacteria. So when the microbiome of C. elegans was sequenced, um, so work done by Marie Ann Felix and Buck Samuel and others, what they found was that there are a lot of different species in the worms environment. So um, they had sequenced all these, but they discovered about a third of these are pseudomonas species. And this is interesting because Pseudomonas species can um, be a great food source for the worms, but they can be uh, pathogenic, especially at high temperatures. And so what I mean by that is when we feed worms, so this is on the left, we see non-pathogenic E. coli fed animals. They look nice and healthy. And we can tell it because they're, you know, their tissues are in great shape. But an animal of the same age that's been fed Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this, um, we're going to talk about PA14, which is a clinical isolate of PA14 of, of Pseudomonas. So when they've been on Pseudomonas for the same amount of time, they start to look really bad. They've lost all their fat and they're starting to spill their guts. And within a couple more hours, all of the animals will be dead. So it's really bad for them. But the crazy thing is that they really love the smell of Pseudomonas. So if you grow worms in the lab on E. coli LP50, the yellow here, and then you ask them when they grow up, what food do they want to, what they're attracted to, they actually immediately all run over to the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this is very strange, right? So they are really attracted. And so I'm going to show you a lot of these choice assays. It's very simple. The choice for Pseudomonas is the downward arrow and choice for E. coli or avoidance of Pseudomonas is actually upward, okay? So what Corey Bargman's lab showed many years ago is that if worms are fed pseudomonas, so it's been, in their case, uh, in Corey's lab's case, they grew them for about four hours. So if the worms are exposed to pseudomonas for uh, some amount of time, then they learn to avoid it, right? So now they're all going towards the E. coli. And we found the same thing. But what we were interested in is not just the mothers, because we know that they'll avoid it after they've been treated, but after these mothers have been um, taken off of the pseudomonas and we get their eggs and we develop those progeny on E. coli, then what do they do? And we were really surprised to find that in fact, they already know to avoid the pseudomonas as well. Okay, so you could argue that maybe the eggs inside the mother were exposed to pseudomonas. So we wanted to ask how many generations does this behavior last? What we see is that the grand progeny already know to avoid, and so do the great grand progeny and the great great grand progeny. And it's only in the F5 generation when they go back to their natural attraction towards PA14. And that's shown here. So we see this very sort of constant uh, choice where they, they learn to avoid, but then they switch back to their uh, natural preference for PA14. Okay, so it's legitimate to ask, is this, you know, something with uh, Pseudomonas or does it involve other species as well? So other uh, labs have studied the effects with Serratia marcescens. Um, it's important to note, I think, that Serratia is not abundant in the worm's microbiome. Okay, so we're asking now, what do they do if they've been gone, if you use Serratia marcescens in the same way? So what we see is that worms do learn to avoid Pseudomonas and again, I mean, Serratia marcescens, and that was again shown by um, Corey Barman's lab previously. <clears throat> 
But when we look at the F1 generation, they don't retain this information. So instead, they go back to their natural attraction to serratia. And then we can ask whether there's any sort of specificity. So if we train animals on serratia, they have learned to avoid it, these are the mothers, but they don't learn to avoid pseudomonas. So it's species specific. And the same thing happens if we train on uh, pseudomonas and ask whether they're uh, attracted to pseudomonas. So we can see that this is just basically a pathogen specific learned avoidance. Okay, so of course we want to know how do they do this? What's happening in these progeny before they encounter them? And so to start to ask this question, we simply did um, RNA-seq on the eggs from these mothers. So these are the progeny. And one thing to note was that um, instead of just seeing innate immunity genes, what we saw were a whole lot of neuronally expressed genes. And in fact, one of those was DAF7 or TGF beta. So this is the, DAF7 is the TGF beta ligand, and it's already been implicated in innate immunity and avoidance of pseudomonas by others. And then when we look at the progeny, so the F1s of mothers that were trained, we see that DAF7 is really brightly expressed in this AS, ASI neuron. Okay, so this is an intern, I mean, it's a sensory neuron, um, and we can see that it's really highly up in that progeny generation. But we can ask again, how long does this last? And we see that again, all the way through the F4 generation, we have a high expression of DAF7 that disappears in the F5. So that correlates really well with the behavior that we see. And we know through ablation experiments and mutant experiments that ASI and DAF7 are required for this behavior as well. All right. So we started to look at small RNAs as well. And that was because we already knew from other work by other labs that microRNAs should be changed in uh, at least the mothers. And we also see this in the progeny. But what was really striking to us was the sheer number of pi RNAs that we found that are differentially expressed in the progeny of trained mothers. Okay, so it's a huge number. And these are really tiny. These are 21U small RNAs. So instead of studying these pi RNAs individually, uh, we asked whether the regulators of pi RNAs could affect TEI. So we first looked at the Argonaut PRG1. And what we see is that if we use these mutants, so uh, for those of you not C. elegans um, people, so this is a mutant and you can see this is the allele number. And what we found was when we trained PRG mothers, their progeny couldn't learn to avoid pseudomonas, okay? So um, we went on to look at the rest of the parts of this pathway. So we have this PRG1 argonaut here. We know that downstream we have the RDRP complex of MUT7 and RF1, HERD1, NERD2, 4, NERD1, and uh, HPL2. And what we know is that uh, from doing these similar kinds of experiments is that they are all required for this result. And then we can ask what is happening upstream or downstream. And the reason we wanted to ask this was because um, there's an Another idea in the um, literature from Oded Rahavi's lab showing that um, some change in neurons might affect the germ line. So we tested whether mutants in PRG1, which I'll show you later is acting in the germ line, can affect the neurons or is it vice versa. And what we see is that when there's mutant PRG1, so this argonaut, that's required for DAF7 to turn on in the ASI neuron. Okay. So this tells us that the pi RNA pathway is acting upstream of neurons, not vice versa. Okay, so I've already shown you this. We were also able in this first paper um, to place, because we could tell the difference between the naive preference, the learned avoidance, and the transgenerational inheritance, we could place a lot of the mutants that we looked at, for example, the compass complex mutants um, in their respective roles in this whole process. Okay, so I've showed you a lot of mutant analyses. Um, and so this is how we're placing them in the pathway. But we can step back for a second and ask a different question, which is, what's the signal that the bacteria are giving to the worms for this information? Because I told you it was bacteria uh, species specific. And so what, the first thing we thought of was looking at metabolites. And that's because Dennis Kim's lab had already shown that a phenazine metabolite is important for uh, at least mothers to learn to avoid. So we took the bacteria and we spun it down and we trained the animals on the supernamed. But what you can see here is that that did not 
induce the learning effect. So that real rules out secreted metabolites as a signal that the animals are taking in to learn to avoid them. We next start to look at DNA and RNA, and we can see if we isolate those um, off of the plates of bacteria, we get an effect from the total RNA, and it really is RNAs dependent because um, DNAs didn't affect, but RNAs destroyed it. Okay, so then we could break it down into large and small RNAs. So um, we can see that we, when we looked at smaller than 200 nucleotides, that small RNA induced the entire effect. Right? And again, it's RNA sensitive. The cool thing about this is that if you can see the worms here, so here's our, on our left, we have the E. coli fed OP50 animals. The next are the worms on the PA14. You can see they're really sick. But over here on the right, if we just feed them the small RNA, which induced the entire avoidance effect, the worms are not sick at all. And in fact, if we do this treatment, we can get the full effect of all four generations. So it seems that all we need to induce this uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance are small RNAs from the bacteria. We can also see that the small RNA is in, able to induce the DAF7 reporter that we saw turned on in that ASI neuron in the progeny. Okay, now a lot of people have done great work in C. elegans studying innate immune pathways. And so we tested those as well. And it seems that those are not involved. For example, the PMK1 gene, so PMK1 is required for innate immunity and that works just fine, no problem. And also um, we see that the uh, innate immune markers like the IRG1 protein marker, um, which you see turned on with the bacterial on, if we treat the worms with small RNA, we don't see that turn on at all. So that to us rules out these major innate immune pathways as playing a role in this process. So if we summarize this, we can see that um, innate immune pathway is one pathway that's not what we're looking at. And the metabolite pathway, which turns on DAF7 and DASJ, but is not in the second generation, that's a different pathway. And what we're looking at is a specific a new pathway that involves small RNAs that turn on and inherit this DAF7 GFP signal in the ASI neuron. Okay, so how is the bacteria small RNA taken up by the worms? You might not be surprised that the um, double-strand RNA transporters, SID1 and SID2, that are required for RNA interference, those are required here as well. So what you can see is that we have two mutants, uh, SID1 and SID2, and neither of them can learn to avoid upon small RNAs. Um, it is worth noting, I think, that SID1, even though we don't understand this totally, that SID1 uh, already has a high naive avoidance, which we see in some of the mutants in the pathway. All right, and when we looked at other components of the canonical RNA interference pathway, you see those are required as well. So here we see the dicer, those worms can't learn, those mutants can't learn. Same for RDE1, RDE2, and RDE4. And then we can start asking where that acts. So dicer is, uh, we think, in all the worm's tissues. But if we rescue that mutant by putting dicer just back in the intestine, we see that it rescues the behavior as well. And uh, SID2, I should have mentioned, is only expressed in the intestine. So this tells us that the intestine, and it's a logical place because the worms eat the bacteria, the intestine is required for this, the starting the process at least. Now PRG1, that argonaut I mentioned, um, like I said, it's required for the behavior. And when we rescue that just in the germline, we can see that that rescues the behavior as well. So that tells us that the germline is required as well. And the cool thing about this is we're looking at the mothers. Now, we're not looking at the progeny. We're asking, how do they learn on small RNA? And so this tells us that the germline is actually required as well. Um, just to back up this point, we have a number of regulators that are thought to interact with PRG1 or in this pathway. And we can see that RF1, RF3, HPL2, and MOT7, they're all required as well. And this is, again, just this is in the mothers. <clears throat> and as a final test to look at what whether the germline is involved, we asked whether they need a germline at all. And so we use this GLP1 mutant, which is defective for making the germline. And we see that those animals can't learn on the small RNAs. And if their pea granules are screwed up, so by using this MEG3, MEG4 mutant from Geraldine St. Dew's lab, we can see that they can't learn either. 
So, and then finally, I think I may have already shown you this. Um, yeah, the small RNAs are required. Sorry. So the germline, this is telling us the germline in general is, is required to control behavior. Okay, I'm going to back up and tell you a kind of complicated experiment because we are interested in this idea of how can we place all the genes that we're studying, both in the process of learning and TEI. And um, we thought of a kind of interesting way to use C. elegans uh, genetics for this. So now I'm going to be telling you about RNA interference. So the way this experiment works is we have all these generations, right? And so if we tra train the animals in the P0 generation, and um, we only knock down the gene we're interested in in the F1, but then allow them to recover. So in the F2 through F5 generation, there's no RNAi going on. We can ask whether what step these genes act in. Okay, so let me just explain how, what we're thinking. So here's our predictions. So a gene that's involved in the initiation step for uptake of small RNA, for example, if we knock it down after that process is done in the F1, we should see nothing change. And that's why this blue line looks the way it is. If, however, it's required for the propagation to later generations, if we knock it down in F1, you should see it get knocked down forever. So that's the orange line. And if we have a gene that's only required in execution of the behavior, but doesn't affect TEI at all, then if we knock it down the F1, we'll see a temporary loss of the function, but it should come back. So we tried out this experiment. So sure enough, SID2, which I told you is that double-stranded RNA transporter, if we knock it down the F1, we see no effects. It looks just like we did nothing to it. If we knock down PRG1, however, we can see that even if we knock it down only in F1, it forever gets rid of all the activity. The later generations can't benefit from learning. And finally, if we knock down DAF7, which we know is an ASI neuron, we can see that it goes away for a while, this green line, but it bounces back. So this tells us that the, uh, the possibility, the ability to actually do our, um, TEI was there the whole time, but without DAF7 uh, there, it can't execute the behavior, but once it comes back, it can. Okay, so to put this all together, I've shown you that there are small RNAs that the pseudomonas makes, that the worm takes up, and we think it starts to process it in the intestine. We think that there's signaling from the intestine to the germline where PRG1 and other um, genes must act. And then it's there's a signal that goes from the germline to the neurons to control the behavior. All right, so we think that the small RNAs act through the germline to regulate avoidance. They can't bypass the germline altogether. Okay, so then we want to ask which small RNA? I told you that there's, you know, we squirted our small RNAs onto the, the animals, but could we learn more? And this is where we use a differential expression trick. So only plates that are grown at 25, um, the pseudomonas has to be on the surface. Only that condition induces the behavior I've been telling you about. If we grow the uh, PA14 in liquid culture, it doesn't do it. And if we grow it at cold temperatures, it doesn't either. So we um, capitalize on this by comparing these conditions. And we found that only one, uh, six small RNAs are differentially expressed uh, and only expressed in the PA14, 25 degree conditions. So this gave us a reasonably small number to work with. And so we then cloned these small RNAs into E. coli. So now these animals, the worms never see pseudomonas. They only see one small RNA from the E. coli. And what I hope you can see is that P11 was sufficient and it was the only one that was sufficient to induce the behavior, okay? And this small RNA P11 could induce the four generation of learning as well. Okay, so what's P11? So this is a small uh, small RNA that's made in pseudomonas. We don't yet know what it does. Um, and this is a predicted secondary structure. So we don't know if it, that's actually what it looks like. But this region I'm highlighting here has a perfect 17 nucleotide match to a C. elegans gene called MACO1. So MACO1 has homology to the human Macoylin one, and uh, Mario de Bono and PLS and Gupta's lab have shown that MACO1 is required for its chemotaxis, um, neuronal transduction and excitability, and presynaptic transmission. And they showed that it's already expressed in the ASI. So this looks like a pretty good candidate. 
And then when we looked back at our RNA-seq data, we could see that animals that had been treated with P, uh, PA14, um, it knocked down the MACO1 gene expression. Okay, so this doesn't prove how any of this is working, but it matches our intuition that if you have some sort of match between the small RNA and uh, some sort and transcripts, you might get a down regulation, sort of an RNAi-like mechanism. So we got the mutants as well. The mutant of MACO1, like I said, you know, it's one of these uh, mutants that already has a high naive avoidance of PA14, and it can't learn to avoid it anymore when it's treated with small RNAs. And we see that the MACO1 mutant um, can't change the DAF7 GFP expression upon P11 training. So all of this suggests to us that P11 uptake leads to downregulation of MACO1, and that in turn induces avoidance. So for our model, what we see, uh, what we think is now we've sort of, you know, we have marks at the, each end. We have P11 is the small RNA that the pseudomonas makes in a biofilm. And the output is MACO1 downregulation, which affects DAF7 and in turn affects the avoidance behavior. All right, so you should always ask whether something could happen in the wild, also known as physiological relevance. Um, and this is a bacteria, this is actually a pseudomonas called uh, Pseudomonas ravenosis that was isolated by um, Buck Samuel and uh, Marianne Felix. And what you can see is this pseudomonas from the wild, this, the, from the C. elegans microbiome, makes the worms really sick, okay? You can see this, it makes them ill, and it'll kill them in a few days. But if we train the worms on it briefly, they can learn to avoid pseudomonas, this GRB pseudomonas. And um, if we take the small RNAs from uh, ravenosis, it also induces this effect. And in fact, whether we do it with a plate or with small RNA, it can induce the four generations of learning and avoidance. All right, so what about wild worms? So we got this wild isolate of C. elegans called JU1580, and we trained them on first on PA14, and sure enough, they like it first, but they can learn to avoid it. And the small RNAs from PA14 can induce the same behavior in this wild worm strain. And P11 is sufficient as well. And so we think that J1580 acts just the same way as the N2 C. elegans that we use in the lab. And then we mixed, you know, we trained the, this wild worm strain with the wild bacteria, and we get the same effects, and it lasts for four generations as well. So we're pretty confident that the things that we've learned in the lab about what's going on with worms is that uh, can hold true for wild strains as well. And that C. elegans seem to be able to read these small RNAs from pathogenic bacteria and use that information to avoid those bacteria in the future. And they tell their progeny to avoid it as well using this approach. Okay, so uh, the last bit of my talk is about the most recent paper that we've had which has to do with horizontal, not just vertical transgenerational inheritance, but horizontal transfer of information between animals. All right, so we started thinking about um, how could we get, understand better what's going on. And so we thought of this crazy experiment, which was to take the grand progeny. So these grand progeny, they're actually trained on P11 bacteria. So they've never seen pseudomonas and these are the grand progeny. So um, we ground them up and we, applied lysate of those worms onto naive uh, worms. And what you can see is that was sufficient to induce the learned avoidance. So that was the first cool thing. And this correlates really well with what's going on in the animal. So you see that if we do this with F3 animals, lysate does the same thing in the F4 as well, but that information is lost by F5. So the F5 animal lysate can't induce the behavior. That F2 lysate is enough to induce uh, transgenerational inheritance of, as well. So it basically is seeing this as kind of a training again. But this allowed us to do some sort of baby biochemistry to try to figure out what's going on. So we did density ultra centrifugation and tested different uh, lysate fractions. And we can see that the heaviest fraction, fraction six, induced the behavior, whereas the lighter ones did not. And again, this lasted for the six generations. So on a hunch, we decided to look at that lysate and see what we could see. It was pretty dirty and messy. So, um, but we did see these um, small virus-like particles in the lysate fractions. Okay, so then we want to know, of course, what's the origin of the VLPs? 
Now, at the time, we'd been hearing a lot about uh, Jason Shepard's work, and it made us think of something like this. So um, in the Shepard lab, they'd shown that they are viral-like capsids made by ARC. And this is a type 3 gypsy, gypsy retrotransposed on a related gene. And what they showed was that ARC carries its own mRNA into neighboring neurons. And it makes these nice little viral-like capsids, similar to what we'd seen. So we asked whether uh, there was something like this in worms. And sure enough, Jim Priest's lab had shown a few years ago that uh, there's a type 3 retrotransposon, so something vaguely related to that ARC, called SIR1. And that it makes these beautiful uh, viral-like particles in the germline. And we did staining. We mostly, again, see that it, this uh, SIR1 is in the germline, just as the Priest lab had reported. So it made us wonder whether this particular retrotranspose on SIR1 is required for this learned small RNA-mediated pseudomonas avoidance behavior. And sure enough, it was. So whether we look at uh, RNA knockdown of SIR1 or use a mutant, we see that the animals that have lost SIR1 can't learn to avoid pseudomonas or P11. And just to double check whether those viral-like particles are what we were seeing, we did immunogold staining. Now they look pretty ugly because it turned out we had to permeabilize them to, to get staining. So it's possible that the uh, antigen's on the inside. Okay, so I'm gonna back up and say yet another piece of evidence. This is one of these stories where we had a lot of different directions that led us to the same place. So one of the things that had bothered us when we were doing the work for the RNA, uh, small RNA paper, was that I, you know, I showed you that JU1580, this wild strain, I'm sorry that these pictures are pixelated. Um, this JU1580 strain could learn just fine, as I showed you, but then we got this Hawaiian strain. So Hawaiian is a pretty well-known C. elegans that's used for, and previously it was for outcrossing and mapping purposes. We were using it just to test another strain. And what we found was that the Hawaiian strain doesn't care about pseudomonas at all is not very attracted to it, doesn't really avoid it that much. It can't learn to avoid it at all. And it certainly doesn't do anything with P11. So that was very strange to us. And then we saw this paper from Leonid Krugliak. So we've adapted this map for our purposes. They've been looking at something else, but in their work, they actually showed where SIR1 was in the genomes. And so what you can see here, everything with the blue dot is a C. elegans that has SIR1 in its genome. If it's yellow, it has it, it's absent. And over here, we can see the Hawaiian has no SIR1, right? So that was just, that's not really a good test, but it's sort of evocative of something. And so we wondered whether the presence of SIR1 in these genomes of these wild C. elegans could correlate with TEI behavior. So we got a lot of different strains. So it was very nice of people to send them to us. And we not only looked whether it was in the genome, but also whether it expressed at any level as well. And what we could see was that those strains that express SIR1, shown here in blue, um, are able to carry out this behavior. And the strains that didn't express SIR1 can't do it at all. So uh, this is pretty cool to us because it suggested that the SIR1 was actually doing something out in the wild, but it's not really... Um, something that every C. elegans strain uses. And so there's a lot of interesting questions to ask from that that we're looking at now. Okay, so I told you about that um, RNAi uh, experiment that we did to test when genes are active in the different generations. And of course, I just told you that SIR1 is expressed really highly in the germline. So our prediction was that it was gonna look just like PRG1 when we knocked it down. That is, if we knocked it down, it should be gone forever. So we were really surprised when we did this experiment, we knocked it down in the F1 and the behavior came back. So this looked a lot like what we see with DAF7. So this is an entirely different uh, model than what we were thinking of when, it first, when we first started. So instead of acting in the germline to propagate information through the generations, we think that it actually acts a step downstream of the germline. And just to test this a few different ways, um, we looked to see what was going on with our, our favorite marker, DAF7. And sure enough, if there's no SIR1, uh, it lacks then lacks the um, DAF7 GFP signal. So that's shown here in the bottom here. So we do need that. Um, and we can knock it down only in adults. So the point of this is that 
you know, if you think that there's something set up in, in progeny in during development to make this whole thing work, then you shouldn't be able to knock it down later. And we can actually knock it down in adults. The other thing we did was to try to see where it's expressed. I showed you it was in the germline. You really don't see anything in the neurons, which, you know, if we're bright, you should see it in these, um, this nerve ring area, but we don't see it at all, but we do see it in the germline. And finally, if we rescue SIR1 in the neurons, so we have a mutant and we put it back in the neurons, it doesn't fix the, the behavior, okay? So even though ARC led us to this place, we don't think that SIR1 acts like ARC by acting in the neurons themselves, all right? So instead, what we think is that SIR1 so may be important for carrying information from the germline to the neurons. And um, so the data I've shown you so far sort of supports that view, that it must be not acting in the germline itself and not at starting in the neurons, but maybe carrying something from the germline to the neurons and to regulate DAF7 behavior. Okay, so then we wondered whether, if, if this is all true, then can SIR1 kind of act like a virus? And that is, if we take those same F2 animals, so now we've, you know, grown them on P11 or train them on P11, and now we take the second generation or uh, F2 generation, and instead of taking the worms themselves, we just take the media that they've been swimming in. So that's conditioned media, and we put that onto the animals. And what we see is that, first of all, it's really surprising, that worked. So if we just look at our N2 uh, wild type animals, that was sufficient to induce not only the learning, but inheritance of the signal. And it's dependent on SIR1. So we can see that uh, SIR1 animals don't, their media can't do this either. So that's pretty cool. So that suggests to us it's a SIR1 dependent behavior. And so um, then uh, let's see, we looked at the, oh yeah, we took the um, fraction, the media, sorry, the media, and also did this delta density ultra centrifugation and again saw the same effect. So uh, we think it's actually in those VLPs that we had shown before. Um, and over here on the right, we can see that if we destroy the VLPs with Triton, we don't get the effect anymore. So this all suggests to us that there's a SIR1 capsid like thing that's getting put out into the media that's inducing this effect. And someone's going to ask me, it's a great question. We don't know what's inside those capsids yet, and we're working on that now. We do know we could see RNA, but we need to do a lot better experiments to figure out exactly what the nature of those RNA sequences are inside. Okay, so again, we can ask, well, why in the heck would any of this do this? And we think that this kind of, a, this is pure speculation, but we think that this could really benefit uh, the animals in, in the wild. So say you have a mother who is eating this, you know, PA14, the pseudomonas that's making them sick. And even as they're dying, they're like spitting out these SIR1 capsids. So this could really benefit their neighbors um, if they take them up. And one thing that we know, because we did some experiments with the recipients, only the animals that contain a germline and contain SIR1 can benefit from this information. And so this would... Uh, almost by definition mean that it would only benefit their relatives, it wouldn't benefit all Cynorhabditis in their area. And so this would be a pretty cool finding um, if this is how they can communicate really important information, even as the worms themselves are dying. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, what I've told you today is that C. elegans transfer this information, basically their memories of a learned pathogen avoidance to four generations of progeny. And they do this by reading, you know, taking in the small RNAs and using the exact sequences from the bacteria that are pathogenic to carry out this uh, process. And really surprisingly to us, this retrotranspose on SIR1 seems to not only be functional, but it forms these capsids that we think carry RNA and communicate information between tissues and between individuals to share that information. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, Rachel and Rebecca, they worked really closely um, on all this work. And so uh, they're actually co-first authors on all the papers that I told you about. Chem Lesnick did all the biochemistry I told you about, like isolating VLPs. And we had help from uh, Edith Blackman for the EMs. 
And both Jeff and uh, so Jeff did some work with the cloning um, of the individual or small RNA sequences. Jeff and Edith are both were both in Zemmer's lab, Zemmer Gatai, <clears throat> our colleague at Princeton. And uh, Vanessa helped us with the imaging of germ lines. And Lance has been a great um, collaborator for our bioinformatics studies. And we got reagents from a lot of great people, Dennis Kim, Buck Samuel, CGC, and Jim Priest, who also sent us um, antibodies to use for the SIR-1 experiment. And so with that, we'll try to figure out how to uh, to uh, see and ask, uh, let you guys ask questions. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. I, yeah, I think uh, you can just stop sharing. Perfect. So now yeah. you can see us as well. <laughs> okay. So now it's uh, time for people to ask questions either, uh, well, here in the ask a question button, if not in the chat. We actually have one question, uh, but it is not related. I even I can <laughs> answer it if it's being broadcast where it is <laughs> being broadcasted from. So yeah, as Abdul already mentioned, I am in Lisbon and then she's in the States. So um, moving more towards science, um, Vivian uh, has one question. Excellent talk. So excited. One, why is TEI induced by Pseudomonas, but not the other pathogenic bacteria that you mentioned in the, at the beginning? Uh -huh. And two, well, maybe two and three, is SER1 still expressed in the fifth generation worms? Maybe what I'm trying to ask if, is what happened to the fifth generation to erase the learned? Yeah, behavior? okay, so those are all great questions. Um, so, <clears throat> Let me just say, first of all, we don't yet know. We have a lot of projects right now trying to address the question, what's happening between F4 and F5? Um, it's fascinating, right? Like, why is it always the same? What's the mechanism that's regulating it? And we don't know yet. Uh, my um, So Scott Kennedy at Harvard had a very nice paper where he looked at pugilated RNAs. So these are RNAs. They had these UGUG tails on. And their paper really suggested a nice mechanism for a possible timer where the UG tails would get shorter with every generation. Uh, we don't know if that's a mechanism. I probably like, probably it's not great that I'm talking about it, but that's the only mechanism I can think of right now that would explain how you'd get. Um, so maybe there's a pool of these RNAs that get made. And as the pool shrinks, um, it must fall below a threshold. And so you see the same behavior for four generations and it goes away. But to be honest, we don't know yet. All right, uh, that was one question. Uh, why is, you see the difference between serratia and pseudomonas? Okay, so we don't exactly know <clears throat> because we do know that the, right, so one hypothesis we have is that there are so many pseudomonas in the environment that worms have to be able to um, eat, use them as a nutrient source, right? So I think this is a key point. They, there's a lot of them. So there's not very much serratia. So it doesn't make sense to develop a whole mechanism to like avoid and remember a bacteria that is not very frequent in its environment. But Pseudomonas species are everywhere. And the cool thing about Pseudomonas, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a hardwired avoidance because if you did that, then the, the worms would go hungry. They have to re like basically learn that these Pseudomonas can be a great food source sometimes and they are pathogenic other times. So what they seem to have done is figure out a way to correlate pathogenic conditions um, and say, well, now I need to avoid them. So maybe when you know the apple orchard gets to be over 25 degrees, that might be when Pseudomonas might be really uh, pathogenic, but say in two weeks, it might be cooler and then they go back to being a good food source. So I think it's a kind of cool mechanism where the animals have learned to they figured out how to correlate conditions that are good and then forget them later so that they adapt to the ongoing uh, changes in their environment. I hope that made sense. Raquel, did I answer all the questions? Because I can't read them. Yeah, I or think I so. Uh, I don't know if you you cannot see the ask a question below. If you hit on it, you will see the, the, the questions that I'm reading in case okay. you also want to check. Um, okay. But yeah, okay. I think it is... Um, oh, yeah. So this back, back to this F4, F5 question. Yeah, I think, it, you know, that's about two weeks in a worm's world. I don't know why it's exact. You would think there'd be some, but um, I think that has to do with changing temperatures. 
<clears throat> now we'd love to know what the mechanism for that is because once you know if we can figure it out we can figure out like if you made longer tails or did whatever it is uh would it actually extend the number of generations and so that's how we'll be doing the testing we don't know um, but it, it's something we would really like like to understand a lot better because it's so weird that it's it doesn't matter the dosage it doesn't matter what we put on it. it's always f4 and so yeah it's really strange Oh, I know there was a, in the original question that I didn't get to read, there was a question about Sir One. Um, yes. So you can yeah, see. One. Yeah, yeah Sir on. One is not. Okay. So we think Sir One is constitutive. For example, if you look at Jim Priest's work, he wasn't working with Pseudomonas or P11. Sir One is made all the time, whether P11 or Pseudomonas is there or not. So we don't think that pseudomonas affects sir one expression so that seems to just be like something that's running all the time and in fact we think it may be taking any of the contents of the germline that is near and taking it with it so i don't think that has i don't think sir one is specific for or regulated by or cares about uh, pseudomonas at all i think it's just going all the time and it was just luck for the uh, animals that it took up p11 and took it to the neurons and got this whole thing started because we see no evidence that they're connected in any way. And I have a question somehow related to that. Um, so then animals will also need the germline to do horizontal transmission. Yeah. But then it, to me, it kind right. of makes, I mean, it makes sense in the context of, you know, you want to save your family, but at the right. same time, it's like, um, why will you need it, you know? Yeah, that's a great question, Rico. Here's my theory. You know, those peel, the part of the reason we can't even get the enough of these VLPs, the capsids to do sequencing is they're pretty sparse. So I think that the worms are lucky if they take up some, like one or two VLPs, they seem to use the germline to amplify the signal. It is possible that if we had, you know, concentrated VLPs and dumped it on the worms, that maybe it could go straight to their neurons and they wouldn't need the germline for it. I think that they're using it as a way to ampl like take in, amplify, and then they still need that SIR1 capsid to carry the information to from the germline to the neurons. We were surprised as well. That's why we did the experiment in the first place because we we're like, oh, well, if it acts really like a virus, then if we could just like put it on to the worms and they won't need a germline, it should go straight to their neurons. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just pretty sparse. That's, oh, that's, being, that's our theory. Okay, and um, I think uh, this is another question here, but it may have somehow been almost answered. Uh, you showed that the transgenerational avoidance ends very abruptly between the F4 and F5 generation. Is there a reason this particular time scale might be adaptive as opposed to lasting longer or shorter or having a more gradual decay? Yeah, and like I said, I, I don't know exactly why. I'm understand better. Um, it would also be interesting to figure out if there are other... We can, we've been testing with other bacteria, their pseudomonas species. We pr always see the F4. So it would be really cool to find a condition that only induces it for like three weeks or something. So, But we haven't yet found that. We don't know. So we'll understand. When we break that model, we'll understand the, the necessity better. But right now, it's just, you know, it's constant and mysterious still. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, and then there are two questions here in the chat from Abdul that I don't know. I'm guessing he wants me to read them. I think one uh, was kind of like in parallel because he asked the question and I think you answered during the talk, but it was like uh, how those bacterial small RNA are going inside the C. elegans. Yeah, so it is true that we did address that by looking at the RNA interference pathway. One th cool thing to think about, you know, when RNAi came along, a lot of people thought that the, you know, the purpose of that pathway was to break down viral, uh, you know, viral uh, RNA that gets inside the animals. So it's like a viral protection mechanism. The, but I'm going to suggest that maybe this whole system is what that RNAi was for in the first place, because um, if we take mutants of DRH1, so DRH1 breaks down viral RNA, uh, mutants of DRH1 and the um, CF1580 strain, which is a natural mutant of DRH1, both of those can't do viral RNA, I, 
but they do this just fine. So it seems like there's distinct mechanisms for RNA interference to get rid of viral RNAs. And this pathway um, passes on information from bacteria. So I think the RNAi um, system is actually being used for multiple roles here. And you know, we hadn't really thought about bacterial small RNAs before we started working on this, but I think that's really maybe one of the point, like the reason it has this in worms, because the worms are eating bacteria all the time bacteria have lots of small RNAs, and you can imagine some of them would be pretty bad for the animals. So getting rid of them would be important, but apparently they're processing them and using them as well. And he also has another question that I think it's somehow already answered as well. Uh, C. elegans guts do not have any RNA degrading system. I mean, that's what the RNAi interference mechanism is for, is to get rid of those things. So yeah. And one of the questions that I have kind of related to that is like, uh, wouldn't bacteria, this is detrimental for bacteria because at the end, I guess if the worms do not like already know, okay, this is bacteria, I'm not going to eat from here, bacteria. Yeah. So do, isn't there any mechanism that maybe could be adaptive for bacteria to say, okay, now I'm going to change this a little bit so you can avoid me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what impact about the worms make on the bacteria. I think the bacteria don't care about the worms. If anything, you know, the bacteria are getting eaten and makes the worms sick and then they can grow better on dead worms. So I don't think it affects them. Okay, so them. it's not that they need the worms at all for anything or like- Yeah, I don't think so because the they're, worms. that's right, Rika. I think they're just sitting on the, you know, they're already on the rotting fruit and getting all that. So I think mm -hmm. for the bacteria, there's no need to pay any attention at all to the worms. So the worms is really important for them. Bacteria is not important. <laughs> they don't. See, I don't think the bacteria care about the worms. Yeah. And I think one last question. I don't know. For me, it's really interesting. This uh, germline brain communication. So I don't know if you could speculate a little bit if there's any kind of hypothesis of any kind of molecule that could be mediating this communication of these org organs. I think it would be, yeah, so it's interesting that they're using this transposon to take the information from the germline to the neurons. I, I would imagine there's lots of other signals that go from the germline to neurons, but in like, why didn't it just use, you know, make a, a peptide, like some mm -hmm. like a hormone or something to make the neuropeptide to like, see, I don't know why. So uh, I bet there's other signals and, you know, other parts of my lab when we looked at like mating induced lifespan changes and sorry, we, we see that there's other kinds of signals. So certainly the germline does send signals out to the rest of the soma. So they just picked this weird way, maybe because it had to be this small RNA and the small RNA had to be protected in order to get this signal. But without going back in time to evolution to try to figure out like, when did this start and what was there? It's really hard to, hard to know because we're just seeing the end result, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it is cool. so interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we don't have uh, more questions here, so I am going to thank you so much for being here. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I think you guys can hear me. Uh, I don't know what happened. This kicked me out, but uh, bring me <laughs> back again. I don't think I can see or hear Dr. Murphy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but well, I wanted to thank her. <laughs> I will do it now uh, in the through Zoom. I hope you guys also enjoyed it. Uh, we will have the discussion now by Zoom. I shared the link before, but I can reshare it again. It is here. Um,
But yeah, next week we will have another speaker. She is going to be Dr. Feliz uh, Haka, and she is going to talk about nutritional psychiatry, food, and mood, which is going to be very interesting. So I hope to see you all again next week. Bye.